This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. And welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Hello, Dave. Hello, Matt. Hey, Jess. I'm uh, Matt Stewart. Uh, that is Dave Warnicky over there. And Jess, you are Jess Perkins. That's right. Welcome to the show. Welcome to my show, Do Go On. <laughs> Great to hey. be part of it. And can I just also say to you, Matt, welcome to my show, Do oh, Go On. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Do Go On. Mm. Uh, thanks for having me too, Jess. And Dave, thank you for having us on your show, Do Go On. Oh! Oh, great. Yeah, thanks for having us here, Dave. See, Dave, do go on. the thing is that Do Go On kind of belongs to all the people. Mm, all three of us. All three of us. Yeah, yeah the people. If, <laughs> the people, people in this room. <laughs> We're the people. Do Go On. Hey, Dave, I'm already hearing new listeners going, what is this all about? Yeah. Can you explain the show for us? Well, I'd love to explain the show for you, but I've had about 250 goes at it and <laughs> I've never got it right. So a few weeks ago, I put the call out on the show to be like, hey, if there's any uh, musers out there that'd love to make a 60s style song that explains how the show works, like a sitcom style song. We've had a bunch of entries and uh, this one has come from a dear, dear friend of mine Ooh. who you might know as Tom Mitchell, former lead singer <gasps> of Weed Horns. Oh my God. Wait, not Braille face. No. no, that's Jordan White from my other band, <laughs> Playwright. This is even further back than that. Wow. Uh, one of my uh, closest friends in the entire world. And he's a big uh, fan of the show. So thank you so much for uh, sending in this song, Tom Mitchell, that explains the show. <laughs> Welcome to Do Go On, we hope you listen along. Matt, just a day for do a report as the others banter along. The topic is suggested by a listener, they begin with a question at this is Scar. Shoot a boop, ha ha Now I get it. Now you get it. So Tom's also <laughs> explained the show, but also explained what Scar is. <laughs> So thank you so much, Tom. Tom, that is great. That is so, so good. <laughs> Very much appreciated. He sent that to me, emailed and said, should I send this to the Dougal One email? And I said, oh, I'll keep it a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that absolute gift. It was weird that he, he did confuse uh, Scar for Scat, though. I think that was third generation Scat. Ah, oh, yes. Third wave of Scatting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, well, still, we don't know what S- Scar really, really is. <laughs> Neither does Tom. We'll never know. <laughs> so thank you for that. So the show is, yeah, we take this as a report on a topic. It is my turn. And this is the last report for the year. Far out. And tell you what, hell. this year can go suck a yeah. fuck. 2020 can fuck off. <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. You had a good time in 2020? Wait, 2020? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, good Lord. Gracious, no. no. How exciting, Dave. I hope you um hope you really go out with a bang. If this is a mediocre <laughs> well, report, I'm going to be very disappointed <laughs> in out, you. Go out with a bang, we shall. Oh, oh no, there's some sort of explosion. Uh, okay, my question is, uh, <laughs> what topic in the hat uh, sounds like a genre of metal but really is the name of a nuclear mishap? Oh. Well, I don't okay. think, you're not going to get it, but... I, what uh, like an actual genre of metal? Oh, it sounds like one. It's something core. Oh, oh. metal core. Yeah, it's 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 very sinister, very devil like. Uh. Oh, grumble core, <laughs> Dumbledore. <laughs> Is it Dumbledore? It's Dumbledore. I knew it. The nuclear mishap, Dumbledore. <laughs> uh, this topic it jumped out at me because it's called the Demon Core. Oh. oh yeah. It does sound like a metal it does, doesn't it? Demon subgenre. Uh, suggested by two people. Uh, thank you to Stephen Dumbold and Blake Wilde. Stephen it, Dumbledore. Yeah. It also kind of sounds like it could be a genre of porn. Ah. Demon core. Yeah. Wow, you are into some <laughs> weird <laughs> shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's fine. Hey, that is actually fine. Uh, okay, so have you guys heard anything about the Demon Core? I know about Goblin Core <laughs> music, but I haven't. No, I haven't heard of Demon Core. I have uh, heard of it uh, fairly recently when my friend Dave mentioned it on a podcast. Really, we he do together. sounds <laughs> hot. No, but he's got a heart of gold. Really, <laughs> lucky he's not hot. Yeah, honestly. I mean, he'd be arrogant otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, we got to go back to 1939 to set up this one at the onset of World War II. Uh-oh. The sequel is always better. <laughs> uh, when advances in nuclear fission meant that many American scientists, many of whom had, had fled fascist regimes in Europe, uh, were worried that Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany might attempt to create a massively destructive nuclear weapon. Okay. That was a big concern. Yeah. So the most famous scientist in the world, Albert Einstein, was persuaded to send a letter to then US President Franklin D. Roosevelt alerting him to this danger. And when Albert comes a knocking, you listen. Yeah. And as a result, an advisory committee on uranium was established. Uh, by 1940, it was known that Germany was indeed exploring the new technology, and so was Britain. So eventually, when the United States entered the war in late 1941, a vast array of plants, laboratories, and manufacturing facilities were built across the country under the direction of Lieutenant General Leslie Groves. Manhattan Project became the code name used for the research, with the ultimate goal being to develop and test a nuclear weapon before any other country. I've heard of Manhattan Project. Yeah, the Manhattan Project. Yeah. First they take Manhattan and then they take Berlin. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you can't if you can't take your own city, how are you going to take theirs? <laughs> yeah, and Rome wasn't built in a day. Oh, that's a good point. Hey, hey, hey. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm. Oh, went in that place. Mm. Uh, they spent billions of dollars on the Manhattan Project and employed 130,000 people, including some very, very famous scientists. Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer was the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in northern New Mexico, and he's sort of seen as the father of all of this, Robert Oppenheimer. Also working on the project was at least 20 Nobel Prize laureates. Mary Curie. Yes, hanging around. Obviously, she's yeah. like, anybody need any pel- penicillin? I got some. I got it. I created it. I got it. <laughs> Mainly they were uh, all winners of uh, peace awards. Yeah. <laughs> peace and music. Literature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bring it in there. <laughs> I got Ernest Hemingway. What do you reckon? Can I make this bomb? He's like, oh, um, I don't know. I don't know about that. My heart's a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> For you. <laughs> Uh, there's a very famous scientist. If you're like a, into science, you might know these people. Niles Bohr, Hans Bethe, and if not, you'll enjoy the names anyway. Amazing. Ernest Lawrence, Enrico Fermi, Isidore Isaac Rabi, Felix Bloch, and my favourite, Glenn T. Seaborg. <laughs> That's good. Who discovered 10 different elements, including plutonium. Far out. He was busy. Yeah. And- <laughs> Have a break. Oh, God. Hey, try Hawaii. Yeah. It's very nice. Put your feet up, mate. Hey. He's covered 10, and none of them are the the element that are named after him. Do you know they named an element after him? Seaborgium is an element. Seaborgium. It's a beautiful name. Sounds made up. Beautiful name it? for a girl. It's not like in the first 20, so I don't know it. It's not That's in right. the first. Certainly not. So I don't know it either. Right. What's the first one? Hydrogen. Don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> What's zero? <laughs> uh, I don't want to say too much about the project because I think it would be a very uh, good report in its own right. But long story short, they were successful. Hooray! Is that a hooray? I well, don't know how to it feel. it came at a, a big cost to humanity. <laughs> oh, they were successful. Boo! All the same. Boo! <laughs> Thanks for making us worried about the inevitable nuclear war that shall ensue one day. Yay. But on July 16th, uh, 1945, in a remote desert location in New Mexico, the first atomic bomb was successfully de- uh, detonated. Called the Trinity Test, it resulted in an enormous mushroom cloud some 40,000 feet or 12 kilometres high. Four, that's big. <laughs> and with that, the atomic age was ushered in. That's oh. that's quite large. Yeah, that's a big that's a big old bomb. Am I right yeah. in that? B-O-B. What am I imagining? Yeah. Like bigger than like a like three-story building. Yeah, bigger than like a portobello or a... Uh, oh, fuck, really? Yeah, yeah. Bigger, bigger. than a portobello. Yeah, the really? Ones, yeah, yeah, that's a king of mushrooms. Yeah. You can sometimes get a mushroom burger that's just... A portobello. Yeah. They're the size of a burger. Yeah, well, this bomb was the size of two burgers. What? What? A double stack. A double stack. No. Yeah. They said it couldn't be done. Oh, well, my God. They were, they, they, were a team of on board. they were worried that Adolf Hitler would be the first to develop it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they beat him to it. And a lot of people died from... Uh, cholesterol? Cholesterol. Yeah. <laughs> Clogged arteries. Yeah. So. You wow. think you, you think it's healthy because it's vegetarian, but... 
There's still a bit of grease in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot, it's double the normal amount of grease. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, under the guidance of Oppenheimer, two distinct types of atomic bombs were developed at Los Alamos, New Mexico. A uranium-based design called the Little Boy. <laughs> <laughs> and a pl- pl- plutonium, plutonium weapon called the Big Boy, <laughs> called the Fat Man. Oh, come on! The little Boy and the Fat Man. The, did you guys grow up with? I think I've heard Josh Earl call them these uh, little hot dogs are called Little Boys. Yeah, cocktails. My dad sometimes called them Little Boys, little yeah. cocktail frankfurts. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I've, I never called them Little Boys. No. Yeah, it's very upsetting. Yeah, yeah. When you think gross. about it too much. Cocktail franks. Yeah, I think oh, that's what we call sounds them. Sounds delicious. Yeah. With that weird, little fat, rubbery skin. Oh. Mm. But then um, <laughs> also on Josh Earl's podcast, I'd heard something I'd never heard before, which is that um, his family would have pink soup, which oh, is they yeah. drink the water that hot dogs have been hey. boiled in as an entree. Yeah, pink soup. Um, no, thank you. You listening, Josh? You're Yuck. gross. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. Ma- thought- he wasn't bragging about it. <laughs> oh, no, it. he wasn't. I thought maybe it was like a Tasmanian thing. You know how it can change state to state, but y- your Ooh. dad would say it. So Yeah, little little boy sometimes. Gets rid of that theory. And I'd slap his face. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard, heard people call them chipoladas as well. Oh. Well, that's more fun. Hmm. That makes them sound exotic. It makes them sound like chips, though. Yeah. I'm expecting potatoes. All oh, right. Oh, would you like a chipolata? Please. Yeah. Oh, oh, what the fuck? Take those little boys away from yeah. here. Now I can't remember what we called them. I thought that maybe just Frankfurts. Yeah. yeah, Franks. I think it was Frankfurts. mostly Frankfurts. Yeah. Little boys. Sometimes we, Woody Franks, called... maybe? Is that a thing? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe cocktail weenies? Yeah, 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 yep, yep. I remember uh, at our school fate when I at primary school, uh, the American guy was running the raffle and he'd say, hot dog, we have a wiener. <laughs> And I, at the time, I thought it was so funny. That's the height of comedy. <laughs> God, that's the dream, isn't it? To be a middle-aged dad absolutely <laughs> crushing at a school <laughs> fate yeah. to seven-year-olds. That would be, oh, man. Where does he come up with his material? <laughs> oh, that must Gosh, be... his big book of jokes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That must be one of the uh, few benefits I can imagine of having children is that at some point you're very funny to them. Mm. And then they realise... It's you're just a chain email that you keep reading out, Dad. And then you're incredibly <laughs> lame after that. And then they start just sending you the emails. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about bombs. Uh, the little boy and the fat man, the two bombs they developed. Some of that guy at the fate never did, never bombed. Always, <laughs> always crushed. Always <laughs> crushed. It's the same joke over and over again. <laughs> Little Matt Stewart in the front row just bent over. Say it laughing. again. Say, Say wiener again. again. <laughs> Cut wiener up. sounds like winner. <laughs> I get it. It's Man. very good. Even back then you were enamoured with a pun. <laughs> That's a pun? Yes. <laughs> sounds like winner. The key there was sounds like. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Two words that sound alike. Yeah. Very funny word. And then like. adding hot dog at the start. Because it's a, that's like the same yeah. as wiener. That's the context. Funny. Hot yeah. dog. I don't know if that... We that's... have a wiener. So it's yeah. sort of saying hot dog, we have a... We have a hot dog. Huh, that is good. Yeah. <laughs> that is good. It's Holds good up. Stuff, yeah. Actually holds up. <laughs> All right. So little boy and fat man. Those are the two weapons. It was only a month after the first Trinity test that these two bombs were dropped on Japanese cities. Little boy was dropped on Hiroshima on... Uh, the 6th of August, 1945, and Fat Man was detonated over the Japanese city of Nagasaki just three days later, causing an incredible amount of destruction. The two bombs killed between 129,000 and 226,000 people, most of whom were civilians. Mm. And you cheered this just moments ago, Jess. Did I? Yeah. Oh, Come no. on, Matt. You said hot dog, we have a wee night, so <laughs> That's what I was really Hey, I was trying to lighten the mood. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it is difficult to make any of that funny, but there were plans for a third bomb if Japan didn't surrender. But fortunately for them, they did. Six days after the bombing of Nagasaki, and also the news of the Soviet Union had, had declared war on them, they weren't uh, happy about that either. And so a recording of Emperor Hirohito surrendering was broadcast to his countrymen, and that was the first time any Japanese emperor had ever been heard addressing the entire country. Oh, Isn't wow. that amazing? That's Yeah, really fascinating. So they've been in charge for a long time, and... Uh, but uh, the everyman, you know, peasants and such had never really heard them speak before. Oh, right, at all. I thought it just meant at all at the same time, but they just didn't hear their voice. Yeah, I guess if you didn't, you know, if you weren't in the palace or close yeah, by, which yeah. most Makes people sense. weren't, you didn't get to hear them. Yeah, that's right. fair, yeah. They, were, they didn't podcast or... 
No. Do it like radio. If, if you miss it live, that's it. There's really? no catch up huh. back then. Wow. Different time. No, huh? on, no, no on, on demand. No on demand. Oh they, oh, they couldn't even stream at all. No. So they were just streaming video of them without audio. Huh. Strange. Yeah, you could watch them talk, but never. Never hear, hear them. them. Right. Oh, it seems like a. It's yeah. quaint, isn't it? Yeah. Quaint. I Very wouldn't quaint. go back if I could. <laughs> no, if I God, could. no. I mean, I'd listen and not watch. Yeah. But I would never watch and not listen. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I refuse. Yeah. So they didn't need the third bomb. So back at the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, codenamed Project Y, this news meant they could stand down on the third atomic bomb, specifically the plutonium core that would be the heart of the third bomb. This third core was nicknamed Rufus <laughs> and it was a 6.2 kilo or 13.7 pound sphere of refined plutonium and gallium. Basically, from the outside, it looks like a smooth grey metal ball about the size of a softball. Whoa. It's tiny. It's, quite, it's small. Yeah, so that's Holy the thing shit. that goes bang. Jeez. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dave. <laughs> What? Now I know what a bomb what? is. But it's something so small could cause, like, could destroy an entire city. That's yeah. how powerful these things are. How? I, I, I don't really understand how they, why they had to invent a new one each time. Why didn't they just make multiple little boys? Oh, so they had two different types: as fat little boy and fat man. And and, now, uh, and uh, why, why make a third one then? Oh, so the third one was actually similar to fat man. Right. Yeah, so they've dropped bo- both and found that the, the plutonium one was actually more effective. So let's let's just make more of those. What, were they having a good laugh with these names? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. So How strange. It's so dumb. Little boy. And Fat imagine man. being in the, the meeting where they were like, oh, okay, so Fat Man there, a bit more effective than uh, the little boy, killed heaps more people. Mm. Um, perfect. Yeah, great. Well, let's um, let's make more of that. More of those little boys. Killed lots and lots of civilians. Yeah, I know. It's real bad, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I just what the fuck are you thinking? You reckon those atomic bombs were real bad? They that's, killed... that's my take. Okay. Well, I'll think about it. Sorry, was that so hot that you're burnt? You're yeah. feeling a radiation Sizzling. burn over there? Yes, absolutely. Um, th- though, I mean, they had been firebombing Japanese cities for months, if not years by this point, and often they would firebomb a city and 100,000 people would it's die. Just so, fucked. like... They're pretty used to making calls that kill a lot of people. What? Ugh. Real bad time for planet Earth. Uh, the third core, Rufus, would have been used in an atomic bomb like Fat Man that had destroyed Nagasaki, and uh, it, it could have been dropped in just another four days. They were ready to drop another one. And at the time, there were calls from the military to drop it on Tokyo. Can you imagine? Fortunately for humanity, that never happened, so Rufus stayed at the Los Alamos facility and was used for further post-war tests. And one of the team conducting tests on Rufus was Harry Dolian, born in Connecticut in 1921, while still a graduate student in physics at Purdue University. Harry Dolian was recruited for the Manhattan Project and he arrived at Los Alamos in November 1943. He helped to prepare the plutonium core that would eventually be used at the first Trinity test. So imagine that. He's like 21, 22, still a student, working with some of these uh, really giants of his field. And I just need to stop for a second and vaguely explain the theory as to how an atomic bomb is meant to work. Oh, I mean, yeah, for any listeners who don't know, uh, sure. Good point. Yeah, I was sure, wondering sure, why sure. you would waste the time doing it, but yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Could, like, who knows who's listening? Uh, yeah, children I, could be could listening. Be, could be kids. Right. This is for the kids. Yeah, this Break is, it down. Explain it to them like they're six-year-olds. Yeah, yeah kids kids episode. maybe four-year-olds. Yeah, there could be four-year-olds listening. Okay. So, it bad. Uh, I should add, this is the theory as I understand it. Uh, I am not a nuclear scientist. In fact... Wait, what? This may shock you, but <laughs> I'm, not a scient- I'm not a scientist at all. What? Dave, what the what fuck? What the fuck? What, what the, the fuck? fuck? Sorry for this uh, bombshell. Is that a pun? Apologise for that. <laughs> Apologise. <laughs> uh, and I, I also have to say, the, the people that worked on this are some of the smartest scientists that have ever lived. So uh, A lot of them also carried the guilt of creating these fucked up weapons, so you can't have it all. So 
You can't be a genius and make ethical decisions. Yeah, mm. difficult. Must that's be hard. Okay. Well, that's why being a big old dummy works in my favour. Exactly. Favor. How many weapons have you created that could kill two hundred thousand people in a few minutes? Uh, these. <laughs> Talking about my fists. Mm. <laughs> nice. I could punch you to death. <laughs> you, you could. I uh, won't. You literally could. But I won't. Okay. Also. You'd probably push me up here with your legs. Yeah, I could do that. And to uh, death. Well, up to the top death. of a hill and then down off the other a side. Yeah, mm. a cliff. I could push you off a cliff with my legs. To push don't, me into a steep, steep please. ravine. Please, don't do it. Okay. Please just beat me to death with your fists. It's much kinder. <laughs> uh, this is also hard to explain without any diagrams, but there's a bunch of videos on YouTube that explain this in greater detail from experts. So if you find this confusing and are interested at home, just look it up. But the basic concept of an atomic or atom bomb, not surprisingly, it's all about atoms. Right. That's where the name comes from. An atom, of course, just a reminder, Jess, which I know you know, is the smallest unit of ordinary matter that forms a chemical element. Every solid, liquid, gas and plasma is composed of atoms. The building blocks of matter. Everything's atoms, baby. <laughs> and inside the nucleus of atoms are different amounts of protons and neutrons, and that determines what sort of element they are. Yeah, when, obviously. Hmm. So, but what's important here is when you break apart the nucleus of an atom, a large amount of energy is released. And this is called fission. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not just gone fission. <clears throat> no, it ain't gone fission. Mm-hmm. But is that's how that you... a pun? Is that a pun? <laughs> that's a pun. Right. Yes, I did one. <laughs> yeah. Gone fission. Gone fission. I bet you real funny scientists have that as a bumper sticker. Absolutely. The funny guy in the lab. Yeah. yeah. The guy who came up with Fat Man and <laughs> yeah. Little Boy. The picture yeah. of him with a fishing rod on the end of the fishing rod is like a bomb. Yeah. Gone fishing. Gone fishing. That's good stuff. How's fishing spelt? F-I-S-S-I-O-N. Yes. Fission. Uh So it turns out you can break an atom apart by firing a really tiny neutron at it. And for its size, a lot of energy is released. But if it only happens once, no big deal. You wouldn't really notice. Oh. But imagine if you could make it so when the atoms split apart, more of the neutrons that were inside it fired out and then they slammed into other atoms, right. which split them, which in turn sent more neutrons flying out, and this forms a chain reaction where it happens over and over mm. and over again. That's going to create a lot of energy. Heaps and heaps of energy. Mm. Well done, Jess. <laughs> and in nuclear yes. power, the idea is to control the fission so it doesn't get out of hand. You stay in control of the chain reaction. You only break apart as many atoms as you need to and create as, many, as much energy as you need. Right. But in nuclear bombs, however, the idea is to get the atoms to keep smashing into each other to form an uncontrolled chain reaction that results in huge, huge, huge amounts of energy being released. And this is what makes atomic bombs so effective and so terrifying. The reaction just goes so out of control, that's why there's that blast wave that goes out and then the, the uh, mushroom, mushroom cloud, cloud goes up, yeah. I want, yeah, right. I want, I wonder if the first one they were just crossing their fingers going, I hope we don't blow up Earth. Mm, yeah. They must, yeah. Part of them must have been like, we might, we're pretty sure this won't blow up the whole planet, but. but well, Fermi, did you carry the one? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, when it gets out of hand, that's called critical mass, or whenever it was out of control really badly, that's called reaching super critical mass. <laughs> Super critical mass. Super critical mass, which if, yeah, I mean, if you want to make a bomb, that's okay. You know, you want super critical mass. But in any other situation, you, you do not want that. that. Yeah. No, no. Because it's also at this point that it unleashes a huge amount of radiation. And radiation is really bad for people that are nearby. Yeah. Super critical mass sounds like the time that I wore yellow chinos to church. <laughs> 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 uh, at home, just take a second to imagine the regret face. <laughs> but he always still goes for him, and that's what I love about him. <laughs> is that he hates himself every time, but it doesn't stop him. He's gone for it. You went for it. You had a swing. It's great. It often stops me. <laughs> really? Yeah. God, These imagine, are the ones that get through. Imagine yeah. we could pull down that barrier. <laughs> yeah, like, Matt, go for form. it. Say yeah. whatever you want. This is a safe space. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that was your brain at super critical mass. <laughs> Cheetos! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Dumbass. That's funny. That is funny stuff. Now, do, does that? That's the that's the vague explanation. Do you sort of understand what's what happened? That what yeah. actually, well, I now understand it more than I ever have before. Yeah, absolutely. My year nine science teacher has a lot to answer. Oh, fantastic! For. Great, because I watched so many videos explaining it, and I'm like, that doesn't make sense without a diagram. Yeah. I cannot say that. No, you did very well. So just to reiterate, in a nuclear explosion, a bomb's radioactive core goes critical. Mm. A nuclear fission chain reaction starts, and it gets quickly out of control. Boom. So the American scientists studying the leftover core, Rufus, they wanted a better understanding of the edge where subcritical material, not critical yet, tips into the extremely dangerous and intensely radioactive critical state. They're like, how far can we push it? Yeah, right, before it's... Really bad. Yeah, they wanted to push it as far as they could before it unleashed a, ble- a deadly blast of radiation. Right. But, I mean, like, if anybody's in the area of the bomb, it's still going to create a deadly blast. Yes. But it. not radiation. Thank God. Well, it will create both if it goes too far. That's what they're worried <laughs> yeah. about. It's a very fine line, Ooh. as we are about to find out. Do you have? Do you happen to have a, an easy to understand explanation of what radiation is in your pocket? It's like in the microwave. Uh, it's ba- it's uh, basically <laughs> it. it, um, <laughs> uh-huh. what is it? it is really bad for your body. It's it alters your DNA, right, and destroys your cells. Yeah, I, I sort of get. That it, like that it's bad, but I don't, just don't understand what it is. It's invisible, mm-hmm. is it? You can't see it happening. No, you can't. Well, so, sometimes right. you can see reactions of it, but no, you can't really see it. No. Yeah, I just don't really get what is happening exactly. But it's probably the kind of thing that I would need to study for years to understand. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like you know, rays hit you. Yeah. And then it destroys your cells. It destroys your DNA. And um, the more you get, the worse it is. The yeah. more you're exposed to. Right. And there is kind of a rule of thumb for if it gets to this level, you're going to die. Right. They can't help you. And it's going to be really nasty <laughs> as yourself. So you lose like all all, uh, all your white blood cells, all that sort of stuff. Wow. Which uh, I read that later on there was an accident and that's how they created bone marrow transplants ah. because it destroys your marrow. Right. The first ever marrow transplant was people that had been exposed to radiation. Wow. So they... Gave him new bone marrow. There's a silver lining. There you go. Exactly. It's all it's all science. <laughs> oh, thank God for this. Uh, now, remember how I said that you split atoms by firing neutrons at them? Yes. Well, plutonium naturally sheds its own neutrons. So that they're constantly shedding them. So the team were experimenting with surrounding the core in different materials to see if they could form a shield around it that acted like a mirror that made the neutrons bounce back onto the atom. So the neutrons are flying off it. You put up a mirror around it, it's going to hit back into the atom, which is going to split them fission. Yeah, right. And it's more efficient because it's you don't have to fire shit at it. It's firing stuff at itself. Right, yep. So they monitored the state of the core to see how much radiation was giving off depending on what type of material surround it. So they were just like using different blocks of stuff. Less than a week after Japan's surrender and only two days after the date of Rufus's cancelled bombing run, on August 21st, 1945, Harry Dolian, our young 24-year-old physicist, returned to the lab after dinner to continue the experiments that he'd been doing. Oh, he's stopping for dinner, mm. is he? Well, <laughs> Where's the work ethic? <laughs> well, he actually has extreme work ethic because everyone else went home, but he went back to continue on his own. I don't care. He stopped for dinner. Which, was, <laughs> uh, is, which is a breach of safety protocols. Oh. Oh. Going oh, back so he, in. So yeah. he's a bad boy. He's a bad boy. That's right. Okay. Break for dinner. See you guys later. He just snuck back into the oh, lab. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm back on board. Yeah, he's a bad boy. The only other person in the room was the security guard, Private Robert J. Hemmerley, who sat about 10 feet away. The experiment that Dolian was doing involved surrounding the core with bricks made from tungsten carbide, which reflected the neutrons back onto the core to start the reaction. He was adding brick by brick, monitoring it as he edged it closer and closer to going critical. So the more he surrounded it with bricks, the more neutrons were firing back on itself and the closer it was going. He's edging. He's, he is edging this, this atom. Before, yeah. Wow. Trying to just take his time. Doesn't want to go too early. Yeah, but if you go too early. Yeah. He's trying to go yeah. real slow. Yes, yeah, to create a, a bigger bang. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Uh, brick by brick, he built up the reflective tungsten walls around the core until his neutron monitoring equipment indicated the plutonium would go super critical if he added any more. Remember, the idea is to push as far as you can without going too far. Mm. And it's about to go too far. He moved to pull one of the bricks away, but in the process accidentally dropped the brick directly onto the plutonium core. Uh-oh. It immediately went supercritical, which generated a blue light. Whoa. And a wave of heat. Whoa. What is that? What? <laughs> well, in an instant, Dolian reflexively pushed the brick away with his exposed hand. Uh-oh. This stopped a runaway chain reaction but exposed his right hand to massive amounts of radiation. He felt a tingling sensation in his right hand straight away. Okay, tingling. I was expecting it to feel worse than that. I think it's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. So but he, you're right. You would think. Yeah, just feel like burning. Not just like, oh, I sat on my hand for a yeah. pin. Yeah. Pins tingling and needles. Tingling almost sounds nice, but yeah. yeah. Wow. So he could see a blue. Yeah, blue light just for like. It's like he's creating. A, this sounds like how a superhero begins. Yeah. Yeah, it, oh, it totally is. He, so he drops the brick. He goes, shit, realizes straight away instinctively grabs it and knocks it off, which stops the reaction. He should have got a stick or something. But, yeah, but oh, like some right. tongs. So he, sa- he, but that action saved yeah. the yeah, if he, if he, explosion. Yeah, if he kept it going, it would have gone super critical. Because it, it's one of those things where it, it gathers momentum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the longer you leave it, the more it goes. The chain reaction just gets out of hand like so right. quick. So it's on there for like a fraction of a second. Still already it's gone super critical. He's like, fuck. Yeah, right. Knocks so, it off. If, so, if, like, to get a stick or something would might have been too late. Yeah, yeah, he probably wouldn't have had time. Right. So w- it was pretty courageous. Yeah. Or instinctively, at least. Yeah, instinctively um, yeah, put his hand on the line. His hand glowed blue. Fuck off. And then immediately blistered and he was rushed to hospital. Oh, no. <clears throat> oh. Unfortunately for him, in that brief instant, he had received a lethal dose of radiation. <gasps> He was estimated to have received between 20,000 and 40,000 REM, which uh, translates as Rontgen Equivalent Man, which is the unit they now use, which is four to eight times the dose usually estimated to be fatal. Fuck. So remember I was saying before they estimate, they yeah. go, sometimes it's a bit touch and go, but once you hit a certain point, they're like, oh. Right. And sorry. Would, like even if he instantly chopped his arm off, it's too late. Yeah, it's just because it's his hand, but it's also his body. Yeah, just instantly. You're too just, close. Right. Dolian was hospitalised and treated in an intensive care unit for severe radiation poisoning. And there are photos online of his burnt and blistered hand, and it looks fucked. Oh, yeah. I will not be posting that. Thank you. Poor man. Uh, he slipped into a coma and died 25 days after the accident. Wow, 25 but days. That's a pretty gruelling death. Yeah, it'd be, he'd be in agony. And they just so they just didn't understand enough then? Or well, would they have known yeah, straight away they're I like... Mean, if it's anyone, a matter of time. Yeah, if anyone in the world knows the risks, it's these guys because yep. they've been creating these weapons. Oh, and he wasn't meant to be in there. But he did, you know, he thought, oh, it's easy. Like, you know, I'll just take away this brick and I'll bring it back down slowly. Brick by brick, I'll bring the, the core back down to normal. But he accidentally just, you know, mm. it's human error. He just dropped it on top of it. Yep. Shit. And the, uh, the security guard you also mentioned? Well, the security guard on duty also received a dose of radiation, but it was non-lethal. Uh, although he did die of leukemia 33 years later at the age of 62. Impossible to say whether he would have nat- naturally got that. Right. But that disease, think is, it's possible. That disease is often associated with radiation right. exposure. Uh, but Dolian was the first known fatality caused by a criticality accident. So he was the first ever in the world to be killed by one of these accidents. Right. Wow. He might have been the first, but he would not be the last. No. Uh. Despite safety regulations for the project being scrutinised further and revised after the accident, new rules came in that stated that two people were needed to conduct such experiments, which is already was protocol, but now they were much more serious about it. Instruments monitoring neutron intensities with audible alerts were introduced and contingencies were introduced if ever such an accident ever occurred. But having said that, he knew it was about to go super critical. It wasn't that he didn't know. He just fucked up and dropped the brick on yeah. top of it. Right. <laughs> which, you know, he's already surrounding it with bricks and that's making it go crazy enough. But if you're putting it directly on top of it, that's why it went absolutely yeah. Yeah. meltdown. But that will never happen again, right? Well, cut to exactly nine months later to the day. 
Canadian physicist and chemist Louis Sloten, or Louis Sloten, was continuing the experiments on the Rufus core. Born in Winnipeg and now 35, Sloten had also worked on the Manhattan Project. According to the New Yorker, which has a great article by Alex Wallerstein on Sloten, quote, at that time, Sloten was perhaps the world's foremost expert on handling dangerous quantities of plutonium. He's the guy. He's the plutonium guy. He's the guy, yeah. You get this guy in. He's like the world's foremost expert. Wow. So you'd think, safe pair of hands. Uh, Less than uh, 12 months earlier, he had helped assemble the first atomic weapons, the most dangerous bomb ever made up until that point. And there's a photo of him standing next to it whilst they're making it with his shirt unbuttoned, wearing short shorts and sunglasses. He, honestly, he looks a lot like Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Uh, that's great. I'll show you. This is, you getting Goldblum vibes? Yeah, a little bit, guy? yeah. And, oh, sorry, and there's the photo. I'll post both of these. There's the photo of him just hanging out, shirtless, yeah, that's, next to the most dangerous weapon ever that's made. That's very Goldblum. <laughs> During this time, he actually wanted to leave the ongoing project and return to teaching, but a replacement chief bomb assembler had to be trained up. Enter Elvin C. Graves, who was also part of the Manhattan Project, and had helped build the first nuclear reactor, which was extremely experimental and especially dangerous at the time. He was part, this is Elvin, of Enrico Fermi's, quote, suicide squad. Oh, I don't want to be on that squad. Who were assigned to smash... A five-gallon glass bottle containing a solution of cadmium sulfate over the reactor with hammers if something went wrong. So if there was a meltdown, oh. the hope being that cadmium would stop the runaway chain reaction. Holy shit. But if it got to that point, you'd be pretty lucky to survive standing that close to a nuclear meltdown. I just want to be on, like, the friendship squad yeah. or, the, like, the milkshake squad. So, oh, yeah, a couple we'll steps go, back. We've got to get milkshakes. So if the hammers don't work, you throw milkshakes at it. Yeah. Yeah. But, right? but you've had a chance to go put on a hazmat suit. Yeah. I'd be living in one if I was. Oh, great call. In the suicide yeah. Squad. Yeah. One made out of like double petroleum. Yeah. Or something, something even stronger than that. Yeah. Triple? I'd be in a full suit of armor, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Made out of, <laughs> made out of uh, one, maybe each of the top 10. Because uh, that's how the, the periodic table's ranked, right? Yeah. So I'd yep. use the top 10 best ones. Yeah. Right. So you First one, hydrogen. Hydrogen. The second one, f- f- helium. F- helium. Fantastic. So you're surrounded by gas. Yeah. But yeah, hard gas. Oh, though. but what if you suck in helium and you have a funny voice at all times? Yeah, perfect. Light the mood. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, everyone, step back. I've got a milkshake. <laughs> I've got a milkshake. Oh, no, it's going into meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> Run. Run. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to take that guy seriously. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> oh, no, meltdown. Oh, oh, God. What a horrible kill. Tell my wife I love her. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Sloten? Elvin? You say something? That's great. Yeah, so that's, that's a good, I think that's a solid plan. See, so yeah, that was the top two. Hydro and helium. Love yeah. It. Yeah, I'll use, and then, and the, then following the following. And then the following, yeah. Yeah. Philharmonic. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else you got there? Didorium. Di- yep. Seaborgium. Let's not forget yeah, that one. Seaborgium. Like mm-hmm. Bborgian. <laughs> Deborgian. Deborgian. Wow. <laughs> Feeborgian. Feeborgian. Wow. I'm using it. Yeah. So you got a couple, a couple of them come from later on, but I, you know, give them a go. You sort of sometimes you got to like g- believe. In an element, mm-hmm. and it'll grow. Yes, it'll right. grow with your belief. <laughs> it'll grow in importance. Yeah. So sometimes, like, will one element overtake another? Yeah. Yes, well, absolutely. have you? I mean, have you been concentrating on the table? They change around all the time. Dave, right. you've got to watch the table news. So the ranking system. Yeah. Yeah. Love if that. one of them is really improved, uh, sometimes the head of the table will go shuff up a bit. What do you? What do you? Th- <laughs> what would you say is 2020's most improved element? Uh, most improved. Yeah. Probably boron. Wow. Yeah, Boron's coming up with a bullet. Yeah, it used to be Boron used to be I laughed at, but now now it's yeah had a good had hard, a real long good year. Look at itself. Big preseason. Been in the gym. Yeah, yeah, bulking up and yeah, just having a real body. Looking yeah, good. Red hot. Yeah, put on a lot of weight, but mostly muscles. Yeah, all muscle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's all tone. <laughs> They're actually starting to shed. So that bomb's actually called Muscle Man or Shred. Is it Shred or Shred? Shred. shred. Yeah, They're actually shred. Start, They're in the Shred phase. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see yeah, but uranium sheds. 
Neutrons. All right. Science facts. Break it down. Thank God we're here to explain yeah, science I know. to Thank these you. dummies that break listen. Break it down. Honestly, that's what. <laughs> break it down now. Break it down. Boron. Tell my wife I love her. Oh, no. <laughs> that really got me. That was fun. Dave's come in. Science class. Year 10. Hat. Backwards. <laughs> Let me wrap. <laughs> Let me wrap some elements. And which way, which way does he sit on the chair? Oh, you better believe it's the wrong way. <laughs> oh, he's so bad. Oh, no. Sitting upside down with the legs going into my arms. <laughs> Ow. Ow. Fuck, this hurts. God, I look so cool. I man. wish there was another way. Oh, if only there was another way. <laughs> I see a rule, I break it. In my ass. <laughs> yeah, break it off in my ass. <laughs> Broke a chair leg off my ass. i got to go to the hospital. <laughs> Help me. But what have we learnt today, kids? <laughs> so anyway, back to Sloten. He, he wants to get out of the game. He wants to go back to teaching physics and chemistry. Oh, uh, this, okay. Is this, the, is this a story where if that had happened, he'd still be alive, happy? Well, probably not now. I mean, this was 75 years ago. Sure. People can't live past 75 in no, Dave's I didn't world. This guy. No. I'm sorry. This newborn baby can't even live 75 years. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, well okay. I mean, if he was still alive, he'd be 110. He yeah. could be. It's possible. It's possible. I be- I'd like to believe it's possible. Yeah. It, no, Dave, it is. People have done it. So, so what I'm saying is he's alive. Okay. Yeah. In here. Where are, you, where are you pointing? My boob. Yeah, okay. <laughs> He's living, living in there. I was going to say amongst the milk, but you probably aren't no. producing any of that. No. It's that going to waste. Concerning. Absolutely. <laughs> you're absolutely <laughs> wasting that milk. <laughs> so back to Sloten. Uh, Alvin C. Graves is coming in to replace him. and uh, But during this time, Sloten was continuing uh, the work of experimenting to get the core to the point of going critical without it actually going critical. They're still edging this little thing. He had developed his own method of getting it very close to critical, and it also become. <laughs> oh no 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 no! Oh whoa 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 Grandma. <laughs> Grandma. <laughs> what a nightmare it must be to... <laughs> if you're having to think of stuff that grosses you out. Maggots! Uh, maggots! Can't oh, wait maggots. to burn a nut. <laughs> so a lot of it is actually thinking about gross things. A lot of it's actually quite traumatic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's real hot. Poverty, poverty, poverty. Oh, okay, okay, I'm good. I'm back. <laughs> so he's continuing to... Trying to get it to go critical without going critical. He had developed his own method of getting it real close and he'd become a bit of a showman known for his bravado. Yeah. He was known to wear his trademark blue jeans and cowboy boots whilst carrying out the test. This is the Jeff Goldblum guy. He invited his replacement, Elvin Graves, and some other men to watch the experiment. Mm-hmm. He made them all also wear cowboy boots. <laughs> yeah. Come on, guys. This isn't for safety. It's fun. You've got to look cool. Okay. It's fun. Teamwork. What he would do is he would slowly lower a lid of beryllium that looked... What number is that one, Jeff? Four. Number four. A lid of beryllium that looked like a large bowl over the top of the core. This is technically called a tamper. Beryllium reflects neutrons, so the closer it got, it got to fully covering the core, the more fission occurred. So if you lower it really close to it, the chain reaction's gone crazy in there. But he never wanted to fully enclose the core with the beryllium for it risked going critical. It's kind of like a chef with a metal cloche covering a fancy meal. Mm. He never wanted to fully cover that meal. It's a great Because you eat with your eyes. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Thought of that myself. Yeah. I thought of Tampa, Tampa, Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> Simpsons so reference. That's, that's not bad. Uh, so he would put a little hole in the top of the tamper so he could hold it in one hand. A bit like how you hold a bowling ball. Yeah, okay. So he's holding the outside of the, the round bowl, but there's a hole in the top of it, so he puts his thumb in there, and then he can hold it with one hand. And this is where it gets really dodgy. Between the bottom of the tamper and the outside of the core, he, in the other hand, had a screwdriver. Hmm. In theory, the screwdriver formed a wedge between the tamper and the core's base, so the n- lid never fully closed over the core. So he's holding it in one hand, the, the tamper, and then the other hand, he's jamming 
a flat head screwdriver so it can never close properly. It's got a real DIY home handyman kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With what? a fucking plutonium core. And his thumb. Yeah, what? his thumb's exposed. Is, is that what you're saying? His thumb's exposed? Yeah, but it's not. It's not going critical, so it's fine. Right. He's put a little condom on it, so oh, it's weird. Yeah. They protect from everything. Finger gloves. Mm. It is. Yeah, a couple of fingers. <laughs> Sorry. It was a pretty precarious wedge, especially when you're dealing with some of the deadliest shit man has ever discovered. And nine months earlier, it's killed your friend and colleague in a horrible and painful way. Mm. Nevertheless, he'd done this experiment many times. Oh, dear. This is despite warnings from senior colleagues. Enrico Fermi, who's a giant in their field, often called the architect of the nuclear age, he warned Sloten that he would be, quote, dead within a year if he continued to do such precarious experiments. Shit. The architect's a very cool nickname, by the way. Oh, that is cool, isn't it? Yeah. Do you prefer that or Cobra? The architect. <laughs> nah, Cobra. You can be the architect. That's great. You're more likely to pull off the architect. Yeah, though. you look like an architect. You do not look Thanks. like a Cobra. Exactly. So it's such a good code name. Like in a, in a movie, if I was like an arms dealer or something, that throughout for the first 45 minutes they'd yeah. talk about Cobra and you'd be imagining like this amazing, tough, badass guy and then like I'd meet them in Times Square or something they'd be like, you're Cobra? Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Hey, hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I sucked in too much helium. <laughs> now I sound like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Cobra out. <laughs> Cobra out. <laughs> yeah, sure, we'll be able to give you a shipment of M16 rifles. No worries. <laughs> Toodaloo! Toodaloo! <laughs> I keep them in my mum's garage. <laughs> Come round after eight yeah. so she doesn't see. Yeah, if she sees me, she'll be like, why is this Spanish man coming inside our house <laughs> with a briefcase full of money? <laughs> mum, st- don't worry about it. It's my no, friend. He doesn't need a cup of tea, mum. <laughs> why are you selling M16s to a Spanish man? I don't know. Because <laughs> I mean, Spanish men need so M16s as yeah. well. I wouldn't say no to a Spanish man. I see colour nor creed. The only colour I see is green. Money. <laughs> and money isn't green. How confusing that all their money is the are. same. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I take that back. I've just never seen a dollar <laughs> bill. <laughs> that's not something I have in my wallet, let me tell you. Well, you got to probably get to do some real business and then you'll see the real colour of money. That's right. That's right. you got to do some dodgy cash-only jobs. But if I had a 50 and a 10... You put them together. Yeah. 60. You got 60. $60. And then I'm only, I'm only 40 Whoa. away. You've got a majority of $100. Mm. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. So he's been told, mate, you'll be dead if you keep doing this yeah. shit. But he keeps doing it. And now he's showing people. The screwdriver experiment even got its own nickname. The it screwdriver was... experiment? <laughs> It's even more badass. Oh. It was called, well, maybe not. It was called Tickling the Dragon's Tail. No, that sucks. I hate that. Because it was known as being extremely risky. One, why would you tickle a dragon's tail? And two, why would you balance your life on a fucking screwdriver? Yeah, it's not a great idea. I don't, I don't mind it, tickling the dragon's yeah. tail. It sounds like a euphemism for wanking. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why it's so good. It works two ways. <laughs> Multiple entendre. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the known risk, Soton continued the experiment, this time in a room full of guys, including his replacement, Elvin Graves, as well as three physicists, an engineer, a photographer, and a security guard. So there are eight men in the room. And to quote from the New Yorker again, As he began the slow and painstaking process of lowering the tamper, one of his colleagues, Rayma Schreiber, turned away to focus on other work expecting that the experiment would be uninteresting until several more moments had passed. Uh Uh-oh. But suddenly, he heard a sound behind him. Uh Uh-oh. Sloten's screwdriver had slipped, and the tamper had dropped fully over the core. Oh, no. When Schreiber turned around, he saw a flash of blue light and felt a wave of heat on his face. Oh, on his face. A week later, he wrote a report on the mishap, where he wrote... The blue flash was clearly visible in the room, although it, the room, was well illuminated from the windows and possibly the overhead lights. The total duration of the flash could not have been more than a few tenths of a second. Sloten very quickly in flipping the tamper piece off. This was about 3pm. So he's balancing the screwdriver, but it's slipped out, and now the cloche has gone fully over it, and then it's in split second gone super critical. Right. And... 
Yeah, so the guy who had the blue light in his face, he, a week later, is still not in a coma or anything? No, he was okay. He was far, far enough away. Right. But Jeff Goldblum... But Jeff Goldblum, he well, he quickly he realised his mistake straight away. He knocked the two halves apart and stopped the chain reaction from getting even more out of control. Yeah. He then quietly announced to the room, well, that does it. Hmm. He knew it was really bad. The security guard watching on, who had no idea what the purpose of the experiment was because he was not a scientist, he saw the blue light and was suitably freaked out and he ran to get help. Because you would, you'd be like... What the fuck? Yeah, that that's probably not good. That's never happened before, and they never look this scared. I better yeah. go get help. None of them are cheering, so no. I guess that's not what they were yeah. aiming for. Did you want to see the blue light? <laughs> Should my face be on fire? <laughs> uh, later calculations put the total number of fission reactions, which is when the atom splits, in those tenths of a second at three quadrillion. That's a lot. That's heaps. So that's three quadrillion atoms smashing into each other. Which sounds like so many, but that is still a million times smaller than the first atomic bomb. Holy shit. <laughs> Three quadrillion times a million. But it was enough to send out a significant burst of deadly radioactivity. Oh, no. As an ambulance was called and the rest of the lab was evacuated, those still in the room tried to calculate how much radiation they'd been exposed to, quickly trying to work out who lives and who dies. That's a fun game amongst friends. Sloten, the one who'd uh, slipped the screwdriver, made a sketch of where everyone had been standing at the moment of criticality. In his calculations, he tried to use a radiation detector on various items that had been near the core around the room. Right. He tested a, a brush, an empty Coca-Cola bottle, a hammer, and a measuring tape. Sadly, the detector itself had also been exposed and contaminated so much that it didn't actually give accurate readings. Wow. And he, he's in there going, he's basically going, who in here did I kill? Yeah. yeah. He's like, I... He's like, probably me. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably gone, but ha- how far away was everyone else? Ugh. A- again from the New Yorker, quote, Sloten instructed one of his colleagues to lay radioactivity detecting film badges around the area, which required the scientists to go dangerously close to the still overheated core. The errand resulted in no useful data and was mentioned in a later report as evidence that, after an exposure of this magnitude, human beings are in no condition for rational behaviour. So he's like the plutonium expert of plutonium experts, and this has happened, and he's told a guy to set up an experiment that will give no data and made him go close to this thing that's still right. uh, putting oh, out radiation. Shit. All those in the room were taken to hospital, and Soten vomited several times, but by the next morning he'd stopped. He seemed generally in pretty good health, but his left hand, the one that had been closest to the core, was tingling and became increasingly painful. Both of his hands began to blister. His whole dose was around 2100 REM, or REM, of neutrons, gamma rays and X-rays. 500 REM is usually fatal for humans. So he had four times that. Wow. His parents were flown out to see him in hospital. His white blood cell count dropped, his temperature and pulse were all over the place, and an examining physician noted internal radiation burns that he described as three-dimensional sunburn. Oh, don't really know what that means. Oh, he's doesn't cooked, sound good. He cooked his organs. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fucking incredible. Yeah. That's something you can't see mm. or, you know, like I know. that can impact a human that way. Yeah, just... It is like, you know, putting yourself in the microwave at a really high temperature real real quick. Eventually, he sank into a coma and died nine days after the exposure, dying in the same hospital room as his friend and colleague Harry Dolian had. What was Dolian's exposure? Was it similar or was it more? It was, uh, I think it was similar, but he died after 25 days. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't remember the number for him. He'd had a lot more, actually, just looking up here. He'd had 20 to 40,000. But for yeah. whatever reason, maybe it was his position over the core because um, Soten was standing right over the top of it. Mm. It really fucked him up. Yep. So that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He was His body was shipped back to Winnipeg where it was buried in a sealed casket, probably still radioactive. And he was, oh. th- he was 35 years old, not very old at all. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Yeah. The nearest person to Soten, uh, Sloten during the experiment was the man that was to replace him, Elvin C. Graves. He'd been watching over Sloten's shoulder and was thus partially shielded by him. 
receiving a high but ultimately non-lethal radiation dose. That is a, 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 some silver lining for this guy is that he, his body actually protected most of the rest of the room. Right. Wow. He'd copped it and absorbed it all. That's why he okay. died. Yeah. But no one else in the room died because <gasps> he was standing over it. Really? And did anyone get leukemia or anything like that? Well, Elvin C. Graves is the closest guy. He developed chronic, even though he he, uh, he was hospitalised for several weeks, he lost his hair and he at a, at a time had a sperm count of zero. Wow, that's so. It's, uh, yeah. Wow. At a time, so they came back. Well, he developed chronic neurological and vision problems as a result of the exposure, but he did recover. He returned to work and had a healthy baby daughter two years later. Holy right. shit. Two years later as well. That's like, that's a pretty quick turnaround. Pretty good effort. Yeah. Wow. It, he did die of a heart attack 20 years later at the age of 55, and it's unclear whether the exposure contributed to this. Yeah, right. right. I suppose you, you could say that for any of their deaths, can't you? Yes. Well, and another guy, Marion Edward uh, Shalesky, he was a physicist who was also in the room. He died of leukemia 21 years after the accident. Wow, that's starting to feel like, I yeah. mean, it's a small sample size, but a bit yeah. of a pattern. And only 20 years later, and I think the security guard was like 30-something, 30 35 yeah. years later or something. Same yeah, same thing. And Dwight Smith Young, the photographer in the room, he died 27 years later of a plastic anemia where the body fails to produce blood cells in sufficient numbers. Right. And this is possibly a side effect of radiation poisoning. Yeah, that sounds about right. But again, right. it's hard to say, would he have developed that anyway? Did it make it quicker or did it make it happen? Right. It's really hard to say. Yeah. So after being involved in the first two deaths caused by a criticality accident, Rufus began being referred to as the Demon Core. Oh, okay. So that's why it's called that. And why are they even still playing with it now? Yeah. There's other toys. You know, get a slinky. Oh, yeah. Slinkies are not They're fun. Wait, but it... has anybody died of radiation poison after playing with a slinky? Well, yes, but yes. not for a long time. <laughs> okay. After it fell into a reactor core and someone <laughs> jumped after it. <laughs> what, My slinky. What, so what, what's the goal of it at this point? Oh, they were, just, they were just continuing experiments to work out ways of getting it critical. This is for a possible, like, for making, post-Second World War now. Post-Second World War, but still to make an even more effective bomb. Right. Yeah, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, prior to the second accident, it was expected that the Demon Corps would be sent to the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, where it would, uh, which I believe is where the For a holiday. Uh, bikini comes from. What? The the huh. name Bikini. There you go. In the Marshall Islands, it would uh, where it would be detonated as part of Operation Crossroads, the first post-war series of nuclear tests. Uh, thousands of observers were to watch these explosions, including Louis Soton. He was supposed to be there, but he never made it. Mm. But after the incident, the core was still radioactive and they had to wait for the radioactivity to decline, so it never made it to this to this bomb test. It's a, it's interesting okay. they called it the Demon Core, but it, sounded, it was two cl- just clumsy accidents. Two fuck-ups. Yeah. It was full human error. Yeah. I, you can't really blame the core for that. For doing what it was designed to do. Mm. Yeah, it's oh, it's amazing. Are you imagining Rufus as like a, a cute little animated bomb? I guess so, yeah. yeah. Can't blame him. You can't blame Rufus. Come on. Yeah. And I ask you because I definitely am. <laughs> you naughty demon core. <laughs> oh, Rufus. You know, I watched Paddington the other night and he's like so well-meaning, but he just keeps making mistakes. Mm. Doesn't know how sticky tape works, Aww. so he gets it everywhere, you know? But he's not radioactive. No. Well, as far as I'm aware. I haven't seen the second one, Neither so right, I don't actually. know. <laughs> uh, eventually, Rufus, the demon core, was melted down in 1946 and reintegrated into the US nuclear stockpile. The two incidents at Los Alamos had a lasting effect on nuclear safety. All hands on assembly work was banned, and people no longer handled cores with their hands. Good. Subsequent critical testing of Fissile cores was done with remotely controlled machines with the operator sitting safely in another room. That's this, a good this, idea. Yeah, yeah, this adds up. That's funny. I guess, yeah, I, you assume that's how it always was, but it's become that way because of these accidents. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's like that's why Homer Simpson sort of uses, puts his hands through that glove wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but before that it was just a dude with a screwdriver. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And cowboy boots. Yes. And no buttoned up shirt. <laughs> Sounds like a genuine badass who, um, yeah, just no fear. For no fear, really uh, pro- quite When cocky. he probably should have had some fear. Yeah. Especially in a room when he's dealing with other people's lives. 
But really that's the story of the demon core, and it's a tricky one because the weapons that these men created and developed cause untold suffering and destruction. Yeah. So I don't want to focus the story only on them and their fate, but I just thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. It's fascinating. The lengths that we as humans have gone to. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that they argue, well, if the others, had, if the enemy had gotten it first, they would have used it on us, so that's why we had to beat them or whatever. But a lot of them did go on to regret um, yeah. to regret making it. And even Robert Oppenheimer, the head of everything, he later uh, opposed them making hydrogen bombs, which are even more dangerous. Yeah, And wow. got blacklisted by the government because Whoa. he went, "You, we shouldn't be experimenting with this shit anymore. Right. Um uh, in a- 1989, the film Fat Man and Little Boy that follows the Manhattan Project uh, features a character based on Dolly and, and Soton played by John Cusack. Ah. And uh, he does the screwdriver experiment and it fucks up and it's a really tense scene. You can watch it on YouTube. No, thanks. Yeah. I'll just watch Paddington 2. Yeah. But I'll take your word for it. Yeah, so. Wow. But he, yeah, he's like an amalgamation of the two characters. Dave, that was a very interesting report that even I, an idiot, could follow. I'm glad that it was because, you know... Because, you know, you work with an idiot. Well, as is often the way when you're doing the research or whatever, I've watched these videos and things like that. I want to make it so it's easy for people that haven't seen that to understand. Yeah. But also, not boring as shit. (laughs) Yeah, it's a fine line. (laughs) Much like... Getting the edging something to super critical. Yeah, it's a fine right. line. And can I just say that um, we started the year. The first episode was uh, the eruption of Mount St Helens, oh, a disaster, yeah. and we finished the year with yet another disaster episode. Ah, uh, it seems very fitting for twenty twenty. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> totally. Dave. We should have seen the signs. <laughs> uh, well, that brings us to everyone's favourite section of the show, the fact, quote, or question section, which I think has a little jingle. Fact, quote, or question. <laughs> oh, always remembers the ding. Now, to get involved in this, you can go to dugonpod.com uh, do, or do, uh, patreon.com slash dugonpod and sign up on the Sydney Schoenberg Deluxe Memorial Edition package level, rest in peace, and then you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. You also get to give yourself a title. Uh, there's also all sorts of other uh, rewards that are up for grabs, bonus episodes. We do three a month. Uh, voting rights on topics. Did people the people vote on this one, Dave? Or is this a this was a vote. This was a uh, a very close vote. I put up three topics to finish the year, and it was uh, for our deluxe package. The Sydney Schoenberg Sydney Schoenberg voters, and yeah, this one just by a couple of votes. Ooh. Um, and yeah, there's a, a bunch of other stuff. A weekly newsletter. You get access to the Facebook group, the loveliest corner of the internet. Um, but for the fact, quote, and questions section, you get to give yourself uh, a title. You get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. First up this week, we got Roy A.J. Phillips, who's given himself the title of the pessimistic pest which exists am- am- amidst us. Oh, you did get me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll get you soon, Matt. You got me this time. <laughs> the pessimistic pest which exists amidst us. That's amazing. That's really hard to say. Amidst- pessimistic pest that exists amidst us. A pessimistic us. pest which exists amidst us. Yeah, it's the amidst. Mm. Amidst us. Amidst us. Roy uh, asks a question. Which is your favourite bit or joke from a show or routine of each other's? Context be damned. Ooh. <laughs> bit oh. or joke from a show or routine of each oh, other's? That's oh. really hard. It's been a while now. <laughs> yeah, I know. It has. <laughs> yeah, it's been... Been, uh... Uh, Dave, what's Dave's bit about, uh, especially for Dave? Was your last gig in Kosamui? No, uh, did Perth, Perth, and then Dublin last year. Oh, they were since Thailand. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But um, this time last year, there's what? What's it's, it's a it's a, a classic pullback and reveal line about you being your partner dying or something. <laughs> Oh, being pregnant. Being pregnant. Being I was pregnant. thinking the same one. <laughs> thinking the same, same one. Same diff. And he goes, and I wish her well. I yeah, wish yeah. her well. Yeah, a, that's a very good thanks bit. Thanks so much. That's often an opening bit I have. It's a good bit. People go, well, didn't expect him to say that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's the part of it. He's <laughs> yeah. like, whoa, Dave. <laughs> it's like, wait, that's kind of brutal, fucked. yeah. <laughs> Um, and Bob, I mean, she's got so many great bits, obviously, uh, the classic, uh, the, the, uh, the rapper bit, the classic bit, the list bit. Mm. Yeah. Your list bit is so good. That's it's, such it's, a great joke. It's fun to do. So um, I like it. Uh, the, uh, the spoons. I always love that line. Why all the spoons? 
<laughs> That's one of the very first jokes. I also love, uh, Matt, a, a line that I think that you said sometimes didn't work, which uh, when you uh, what shamed a mutt. I think that's a very funny. Much shamed a mutt. Oh yeah, that's very funny. <laughs> it nearly never worked. <laughs> oh, it's for me. That's just a really funny phrase. Yeah. Much shamed a mutt. I mean, it sounds funny. It well, what do they I'm... want? It to Come be on. funny? <laughs> <laughs> they are asking too much of me. Also, Context... like your regrets, your list of regrets. Oh, you also. What's the bit you have about boxing in your most recent show? Oh. Oh, about punching something punching to, death. Cow to death. Cow to death. Yeah. That yeah, that's... really made me laugh. Because again, I did not expect you to say it. <laughs> yeah. So it's really funny. Yeah, that's yeah the uh, it's a really unpacking nostalgia that bit <laughs> at the heart of it. <laughs> yeah, it's putting up a mirror. <laughs> uh, uh, great question. I mean, he did say with no context. Yeah. I think we delivered on that. That's right. People are going qua. Yeah, saying these bits sound terrible. <laughs> a list I know. bit. What is that? <laughs> what is she listing? Well, uh, come see a show. It's on YouTube. That one. No, tell them to see a show. See a show. I'll never do another show. Really? I don't think so. Who uh, knows? The next one comes from Nicole de Morton, whose title is Burgess of Drunken Stories That Have No Point. Mm. <laughs> and Nicole writes a question, which is, <laughs> if you were arrested, what would your family assume you had done? Public urination. Oh, Really? I don't know. Something like it wouldn't be anything. Like I wouldn't have murdered someone. They'd be like, "What have you done, you dickhead?" Beat up a cop. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm always fighting the power, you know. Yeah. Jaywalked or something. Yeah, it's probably jaywalked. It'd be something lame for me. Yeah, mine would probably. Be, they'd probably assume I shanked a narc. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Not like intoxication. Oh. <laughs> nah, they know. They know that I. Uh, your your dad would probably be there with you. I've got in the back of the divvy uh, van. I've, 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 uh, I've matured <laughs> quite a bit, so uh, yeah. No, they probably would think it's that, but they'd be wrong because that'll that'll never happen. Because it'd be shanking a narc. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, mine would be lame. Public urination, something like that. Mm. Probably mine would be like um. Voter fraud. You know? I was gonna say tax fraud. That's what your parents would assume. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, he's trying to vote for grandma again. God damn it. I want grandma to be prime minister. (laughs) (laughs) I meant voting on grandma's behalf. (laughs) (laughs) I just thought, donkey vote, you're just writing in your mum's, your grandma's name. You can't keep doing that, mate. (laughs) That's a very funny misunderstanding. I reckon if I got arrested, they'd probably think it was some sort of administrative error. Yeah, surely. A different Dave Warnocky murdered someone. Come on. But come on. Come on. Come on. Uh, That or arson. (laughs) <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. The, big two. the big two. <laughs> Great question, Nicole. Um, next one comes from Kelly Clark, who is the phenomenal phenomenology phenomenologist. You were so close oh, to was na- it. You were yeah. going to nail it. on it. You were so. I was like, he's you nailed had it. it. You had the it. phenomenal phenomenologist and nailed it. Kelly is offered a fact, and that fact is a Krishmishy fact, Uh-oh. which is I think. Christmas was in two levels only a week or so ago. That's right. We're still in the Christmas vibe. The tree is still definitely up. Yeah, tree's Big still time. Up. Oh, not mine. I, I'd throw it out the front door. <laughs> Get out. Boxing day. Ornaments Get out. and all. Get it's, out. it's midnight. I cried and kick it out of the door. <laughs> See you next year. Still got family over? <laughs> yeah. Get out. Get out. <laughs> oh, no, not you. You can stay. No, just the tree. <laughs> it's, the tree's out. Would you like another coffee, tea? Mm, coffee, tea, anything? <laughs> Nibbly? <laughs> Sherry? Yeah. Port? Uh, I, I love them. I just start uh, putting on cricket gear. It's <laughs> Boxing Day now. Yeah, come on, come right. on. Walking in with the bowler. Knock <laughs> his castle down. <laughs> uh, Kelly's got a, a Christmasy fact, and it is the Immaculate Conception wasn't the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb. It's the name given to the conception of Mary in her mother's womb. What? what? It refers to the belief that Mary was not impacted by sin or its results, even from her very first moments, as preparation for being mum to God the Son. If this is read before February the 2nd, 2021, it is before the end of the traditional Christmas season. And it it was read out just in time, with a, a month to spare, <laughs> I think. So, huh. yeah, right. I, I always assumed it was the Immaculate Conception was about Jesus being born to Mary without... Yeah, without Joseph's help. I was, yeah. I was assumed it was the the Madonna best of. So oh, yeah. the immaculate 
collection. collection. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of pun work there. Thanks, Madge. Great work. Great work. Thanks, Madge. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. And finally, Thomas Doppelreiter writes, or oh, first he's titled himself the official quiz master of the Duke on Patreon's Facebook group. And you are the master of it. And Thomas has given us a fact as well. His fact is... As I heard you talking about the Flaming Lips on the Krishmish episode, did you know that they released an album in 1997, Zarika, that is four albums and is supposed to be played on four different systems at the same time? <laughs> it is possible to listen for uh, to each of them separately, but it really comes together if you listen to all of them at the same time. No way. Yeah, and so I remember this coming out. I don't think I've ever listened to it, but um, so you back. When it came out, you need four CD players. Wow. And then every time, because you're pressing play on all of them, yeah. or even if four people are, it'll be slightly different every listen because they'll you'll never nail the the same wow. play, or even if it's microseconds off. Yeah, it was an interesting idea. I remember it got a bit of a hype at the time, or maybe afterwards. I don't think I'd heard of them until the 2000s, but yeah, it's a... That's a fun a fun fact. I don't think I'd even have enough channels to play that on radio, four tracks at once. Yeah, right. I wonder if they ever did uh, play it on Triple J. That, hmm. That's where it would have been played, if anywhere, probably. That's interesting. That's, that's a great fact. I didn't know about that. I'd like to give it a listen. Mm. So that's all the fact quotes and questions for this week. We also like to thank a few of our uh, other Patreon supporters. And Jess, you normally come up with a little game to play with the names. Um, what kind of footwear they are wearing in a very dangerous situation. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I like it. I panicked. But that's so all right. He's wearing uh, cowboy boots whilst uh, irradiating his whole body. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, firstly, if I may, I'd love to thank from West Drayton in Great Britain, Keir Beals. Oh, Keir Beals, obviously. Walking wearing... 10 feet off a beal, wearing... Slippers. Slippers. What's a beal? I don't know, it's a line in uh, this one hit wonder song from, I don't know, maybe the 70s or something called uh, Walking in Memphis. Oh. Walking 16 feet off a beal. I don't oh. know what it means. I've never. I, I know the song, I think. Yeah. Walk, walking in Memphis. Is that, a, is that right? Do you even feel the way I feel? I don't know. How do you <laughs> feel? Oh, no, nah, it's got to be. The first line is put on my blue suede shoes. That's got to be what she's wearing. Ah, okay, uh, blue yeah, shade. Fair. Let's use. Uh, um, was walking with my feet 10 feet off a beal. Huh. Beal with capitalized B. Maybe it's just like another word for street or something. Anyway, we've got sidetracked here. Beal. Definition. <laughs> uh, bail. <laughs> That's a different word. You suck. <laughs> All right, let's see. Important to get this down. Dorothea, it's a British schoolmistress. I don't think. <laughs> no. Well, I don't. I don't think that is correct. <laughs> Definitely worth taking the time to get to this. No, all right. I don't know. Anyway, I I have a feeling it might be a street or something like that. But um, yes. It's something you can walk on. Keir Beale. Sorry, Keir. <laughs> Sorry. Keir, uh. Great name, Kier, as well. I don't think I've ever heard of a Kier before. Oh, K-E-I-R. I like that. Yeah. Nice one. Uh, I hope you enjoy wearing your blue suede shoes <laughs> while doing something dangerously. And I'd also love for, to thank from Horsham in England, Chris Steer. Flippers. <laughs> Chris Fleer. And what are they doing? Flip-flopping. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what are they trying to do? Sorry, they are <laughs> trying to... Is it something underwater or the, sl- the flippers Absolutely are unrelated? Not, no. Okay, yeah. So they are actually, trying just to hazard. photograph uh, a cyclone. Oh, wow. In flippers. Yeah. Mm. They yeah, thought, that... I mean, if it goes wrong, it's going to go wrong here. It doesn't matter what I'm going to I'll do. Tr- if they find my body, at least it'll be funny. Yeah. They're thinking like, it'll, they'll go, oh, what's happening here? Was this guy sucked out of the ocean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bit of a prank. Prank. <clears throat> prank you with my dead body. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just looked up Kier. It's, I think it's pronounced Kier. Kier. Okay. And it's a Gaelic word meaning dusky, dark haired, dark skinned, swarthy. Oh. Kier. 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 Uh, 
There you go. And um, not far off that name is Kieran Darcy from Birmingham <laughs> in Great Britain. Kieran Darcy is wearing Ugg boots. Oh, I love me Uggs. <laughs> I love me Uggs. I love me Uggs, but I wouldn't want to be doing them whilst doing a rodeo yeah. back of a bull. Oh, back of a bull. Yep. With your, with your Uggs on. Oh, but they're you, stuck yeah. in the little... Stirrups. Oh, yeah, Stirrups. they can't get you off. I'm going to call them little... Little shoe holes, mm. but yeah, you call them stirrups if you like. Sorry. Yeah, come on, Matt gets technical sometimes. <laughs> shoe hole. <laughs> thank you, Kieran. Can I thank some people? Please. I would love to thank from London, Tom Rourke. Tom Rourke. Tom Rourke wearing uh, what are they, those little spikes you wear in the ice. Oh, crampons. Crampons. Cra- yeah, but so. I mean, obviously, that it's that's not dangerous if you're in ice, but where is he wearing them? Oh, he's he's wearing them to the supermarket <laughs> to buy tampons, Tamp- and that's dangerous because if he gets the wrong ones, Uh-oh. he's in trouble. He'll have to go back. Yeah, exactly. And he's Who trying to that? he's trying to walk vertically up <laughs> yeah. the shelf. shelf. He's like, "What's at the top top of the shelf? Let I'll me look. find out. Don't worry, I'll get it." <laughs> but the crampons only really work in ice. Crampons are <laughs> dumb words. It's no good. I enjoy it's it. Stupid. I like it. No, but it's <laughs> yeah, I like it because it's so dumb. It's so yeah. I couldn't believe I've only worn them once, and I couldn't believe that they were called crampons. I was like, "What? These crampons? Are dumb. <laughs> All right." Um, I'd also love to thank, thank you, Tom. I'd love to thank. What is this? What's the country code? Se is that Sweden? Are you Sweden? It's usually Sweden, I believe. Yeah, from uh, a place I cannot pronounce in Sweden, Mondal. 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 Titus Drot. Titus. Drot, a fantastic name. And Titus is wearing tissue boxes on my feet. And get these tissue boxes off my feet. And what's he doing with the tissue boxes? What's he doing on yeah. there? He is trying to light a cigarette oh in the middle God. of a petrol station. Oh, no, Titus. Titus, stop it. You're wearing flammable shoes. I know, just wait. Just wait. <laughs> Drive away from Come the on. petrol station. No, he hasn't even driven there. He's walked there. <laughs> God. In tissue boxes. Oh, dear just me. Just got the craving. He's having a bad day. No, I no. Mullendal is just south of Gothenburg in Sweden on the west coast. And the name comes from uh, basically Mills Valley. Oh. Valley of Mills. Cool. Yeah. Nice. That sounds picturesque. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Look at that little spot. Oh, gorgeous. Huh? Beautiful. Th- thanks so much, Titus. Uh, and I'd, finally, for me, I'd love to thank from Coventry, Great Britain. I'd love to thank Poppy Freeman Quaden. Oh, I like the name Poppy. I like Poppy's the name Poppy great. too. It's cute. Poppy was on a short list of uh, of puppy names. If we Poppy had, the puppy if we got a girl. Puppy is a little sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> he great, never washed his hands. Great, great Poppy <laughs> line. Well, it's not, probably not a great one for Poppy. Might not enjoy that one so much, but great Seinfeld line. Puppy's a little sloppy. Mm. And sure, I'm sure that act needing that dough. Yeah, oh, I'm sure that actor's now on cameo, not washing his hands <laughs> yeah. and giving you a shout out. <laughs> and Poppy is wearing stilettos. Oh, okay. While jumping running across oh, jumping castle, yeah. <laughs> While running a jumping castle. I was going to say so, running across grass because right. that's a real pain in the uh, ass. But, but ru- jumping castle. If you're running a jumping castle, the kids can do whatever they like. You're not. They're like. Come on, Poppy, yeah. you're not coming in here after me. Oh, my time's up. Oh, come Force and get me. me. Out. Yeah. Damn you, Damn kids. And she jumps on knowing that she's going to have to buy another jumping yeah. castle worth it again. To, to get that smug come, look off of yeah, little Darren's get a face. Little come up and. Fuck you, Darren. Fuck Darren. Fuck Darren, you dog. <laughs> I would like to thank, uh, if I may. Please. Please. From uh, an undisclosed location, which I can only imagine is the Fortress of the Moles, mm-hmm. Ryan Wessener. Ryan Wessener. Ryan Wessener. Thongs. Yep. Yes. Flip flops. Flip flops on his feet. Yes. And yeah. he's wearing them in Antarctica. Foolish behaviour. Yeah. Oh my God, he's going to get frostbite on his tootsies. Oh no, okay. not his little tootsies. Well, you got no tootsies now, oh, Ryan. Oh my God. So, good yeah. luck balancing. Sorry, Ryan, but that's a real boneheaded move. <laughs> yeah. When did you pack, huh? What were you thinking? What were you thinking? Did you, were you on a beach and someone said, hey, let's pop down to Antarctica, and you said, yeah, no worries. Yeah, he said, it's summer. I'm good the, to go. Summer in the southern hemisphere, right? 
And no one, and you didn't stop to pack? You went straight from beach to airport? Come on, Come Ryan. Come on, man. You'd be even cold on the plane in flip-flops. Ryan, do you sign up to the Patreon for us to scold you? <laughs> because if so, <laughs> we delivered. Yeah, we did it for you there. I uh, <laughs> hope you have a great day, uh, Ryan. Uh, you're, you're a good guy. And wherever you're from, in the land of the mole people, just wish you all the best. And, yeah. Uh, well, it's warm down there, isn't it? Yeah. It's close, always warm. Closer to the core. It's always warm. Not the down demon there. core. <laughs> uh, so thanks so much, Ryan. You are a good man. We assume. I'd like <laughs> to thank now from uh, Dundee in Great Britain. Is it Dundee? Dundee, Dundee yeah, in Scotland. Scotland. Oh, of course. And uh, a beautiful name here, Haig Crookshank. Oh, that is great. Haig. H A I G. So wearing right? wellies. Oh, okay. And. What do you mean he's wearing wellies? Like, With holes in them. Oh. And he's going in all the puddles. With a little. Uh, <laughs> so dangerous. And uh, Billy Connolly did a little. Uh, a wee, a wee jobby. Yeah, in his wellie. A wee jobby. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of fun. My parents definitely enjoyed calling poos jobbies. Yeah, wee jobbies, jobbies. Is good. For I that call, exact bit. Uh, Josh Shell's family called them little boys. <laughs> <laughs> Do not drink the brown soup. <laughs> That's so awful. I apologise, everyone. <laughs> That's fucked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so on your hay crookshank up in Dundee with your wellies with holes in them. <laughs> You're a mad person. I would also like to thank, finally for me, from uh, Shirley in Great Britain, it's Jody Thomas. Jody Thomas. Uh, Jody Thomas is wearing uh, knee-high steel-capped Boots. I'm not, wow. I'm not sure why. Yeah, they look. Not sure why terrible. they go. To, they're really hard to. They're just hard. You can't. You can't really move your legs so well. But Joe's yeah. protecting her, her toes, but also her shins. Yeah, yes. it's sort of like it's. I guess it's sort of like medieval armor sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. But up top, it's just like you know, like a singlet. Yeah. Yeah. I said steel toed, but it's all steel. The yeah, point is, it's like it's sti- the st- I mean, I wasn't lying when I said steel toed. Right. But also the rest is also The rest, steel. that was implied. But yeah. she's wearing those while participating in Ninja Warrior. Yeah. And they are really slowing it down. <laughs> she's like, she's come from a medieval fair. Yeah, she did not have time to change into her but she sneakers. But lo- she loves a challenge. She loves a challenge and she looks good in them. They look yeah. great. And she's known as like, you know, the knight or something. Yeah, yeah. With a K. Yeah, well, yeah. so there's no switch there. Or deadly nightshade or something like that, you know. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there is a switch. <laughs> it's a double switch, meaning the switch is rendered useless. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much to uh, Jody there from Shirley. I believe that's uh, all our patrons. Yeah. Can't believe we did it, but we did. So thanks to everyone. That's Jody, Haig, Ryan, Poppy, Titus, Tom, Kieran, Chris, and Keir. So many great names. I can't believe how they keep delivering. Ugh. It is is it like the o- only make... people with great names are allowed in? Is there a rule or something? I think so, yeah. We're kind of... We should open it up to everyone. Yeah. Let in well, the Johns and really... the Waynes. We are bad business people. <laughs> and the John Waynes. And the John Waynes. Wow. And from... the Wayne Johns. Wayne Johns. Wayne Johnson. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Let him in, I Wayne say. the Rock Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you put the D again? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> Ah, a little play there. Um, <laughs> so that brings us to the end of the episode almost. No, it doesn't, because we have to do oh, yes. the triptych. Let's have a look. Who is welcome to the triptych club? The way this works is if you're uh, signed up on the shout-out level for three years straight, you get a shout-out once, and then again when you hit <laughs> three years, you get in- inducted into the triptych club. I'm losing it. <laughs> You get it once. Hold it when you're it. <laughs> nearly done for the year. Come on, hold it. Um, come on. Um, I now the way this works is I'm standing at the door. I got the I got the guest list. I got the velvet rope. I'm going to lift it. I'm going to welcome you in. Then Dave will hype you up. He's your hype man. And Jess is Dave's hype man. So mm-hmm. Jess will hype Dave's hype. Yes. But once you're in, Jess has also provided some uh, hors d'oeuvres. Some cocktails. What do we got? Well, you best believe we've got little boys. Little boys. Oh, yeah. And surely we've got the a cocktail called Tickle the Dragon's Cocktail. <laughs> yes, we do. 
<laughs> and we also have another cocktail called the pink soup. Oh, oh yeah. delicious. And it's vodka and... Uh, and pink. <laughs> and pink. And little boy... Juice. Juice. It's gross. The hot dog flavoured water. <laughs> Fred Durst would love it. Oh, yeah. And Dave, you've booked a band, have you? Certainly have. Um, small and humble. It's Shakira. Whoa. Yes. Shaking it. You know, she had that song from le Zootopia. Le 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 le. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good song. That was a good impression. Thank you. Again, one more time, one more time. No, I'm not doing no, it again. No, now on. I'm shy. Now I'm shining a light on it. That was so <laughs> now good. Now I'm shy. That was so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there are two inductees this oh. week into the Triptych Club. All right, Dave, you can do this. Ooh. Two? Two. Okay. Firstly, I'd love to welcome into the club from Uritzfield in Austria. It is Thomas Hinteregger. Oh, things just got interesting around yes! here. Yes! <laughs> Woo! Yes! And I'd also love to welcome in from Bloomington in Indiana, in the United States, Andrew Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how can I deal with that? Yeah. Um, F-R-A-N-C-Z-Y-K. Let me just say, things just got... Bl- frantic? Frantic. Ooh, things just got a little frantic. Or... Alternatively, See my if that's, yes, that's <laughs> great. Or alternatively, if we're saying that wrong, uh, things just got a little blooming. To no, I've lost it. I can't yeah. remember what I was going to say there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> where, was, where were they from again? Bloomington, Indiana. <laughs> I was going to what's? I was going to do a pun on Bloomington. Th- I was going to say things just got blooming interestingly around here. <laughs> yes. That's the backup. Yeah. Woo! Okay. In case okay. we've said the name wrong, so sorry. But Welcome in. Fantastic work. Enjoy uh, Shakira while you're sipping on a little uh, pink boy or whatever <laughs> that thing was we said before. Oh, we can't that call it a pink boy. No, what is it? Little boy. Little boy. Little boys. Pink. pink soup pink and soup. tickling the dragon's cocktail. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to the end of the episode. Uh, if you want to find us, we do go on across all social media. Do go on pod. Even That's more right. Accurately. I do go on pod and. Tell you what, this is the last episode of the year, but things never stop here at Do Go On HQ mm. because we will be back bigger, badder, better than ever in 2021 next week. Yes, we will. We never take a break. That's right. Much to our own detriment. Exactly. <laughs> we are tired. You are killing us. <laughs> <laughs> but you love content, so. You love the content. You love it. And we love Shakira. Shakira, Shakira. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for another year of Do Go On. We appreciate you uh, supporting the show, and you can do so by telling a friend about it, posting on social media, giving us a review, or heading to Patreon and uh, chucking in a couple of shekels uh, in exchange for bonus episodes, voting privileges, all sorts of things. Mm. That's at patreon.com slash do go on pod. But until next year, let me say thank you so much for listening. And until then, goodbye. Bye. Bye. Suck a fuck. 2020. Whoa. <laughs> Too far? Nah, just enough. <laughs> this podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. I mean, if you want. It's, it's up to you.